from Vicki Deem, who said, hey, I've got a promise. Let's talk about this. And I said, well, that will be our first one. And it is uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to receive this nifty little paper. Have you, did you get this little nifty little paper? Uh-huh or uh-uh. Okay, there's somewhere in the back that you could pick one up. Did you get one of these nifty little babies? Wonderful. That is the one that's important for you today. Because this is the verse that we're going to be looking at. And if you look in the Bible or you look on this nifty yellow piece of paper, let's read it together. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Good question. Now there is a, an interesting contemporary, well it's not contemporary anymore, song that uh, comes to mind. Patrick, have you pulled that one up? Just the beginning of it. Oh, Dick has it. Pass some of those out. Here, this is just something for you to enjoy for the moment while Dick passes out these nifty papers. Anybody remember the song? Oh, I see Gene does. Oh, if that isn't the 80s. When it gets to the chorus, it talks about Okay, that's enough. <sighs> you had to get through the bad part to get to the good part. Okay, I forget. But, you know, this theme of, you know, he's never going to let you down, never going to drop you, never going to forsake you. That is the theme of this promise. And so through the summer, we're going to embark on this journey. We're always going to follow the same basic routine in that we're going to first look at what is the promise. So the promise is Jesus will never leave you. So you can say, the Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. So Jesus will never leave me. The Lord is my helper. I don't need to be afraid. So if somebody has a Bible that has like where you can swap versions, find this in a different version. I have the New International Version. Does somebody have a different version? New Living. Read it quick, loud. Excellent. Somebody have a different version? New English. New English version, loudly. Um, keep your life free from the uh, love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Excellent. So when it comes to these promises, it's helpful for you to know, I can look this up in different versions. If you look up an amplified Bible, it adds some other pieces that provide color and texture. Um, if you look it up in an older version, you'll have a different reading. And, and so take advantage of the technological resources out there when it comes to a promise like this, to read it in different versions, different stories, different perspectives. The second, third, or fourth thing we're going to do is we're going to try to memorize little bits of it. So let's try to memorize, the Lord is my helper. Let's say that together. The Lord is my helper. See, you almost have it memorized. The Lord is my helper. Okay, let's say it again. The Lord is my helper. Okay, now, the next phrase is, I will not be afraid. So let's say that one together. I will not be one more time. I will not be afraid. So put it in together. The Lord is my helper. 
I will not be afraid. See, you almost have half the verse memorized already. You're incredible. And then we're going to ask, what does the promise mean for its recipients? Oh, this is a context question. Anytime you consider a passage of Scripture, you have to plug it into the context. And here in Hebrews, because remember, we studied Hebrews back a little while ago, Hebrews is all about lifting Jesus. And so if you flip back to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 begins, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. So when the author wrote in chapter 13, he's writing from a perspective that this Jesus that he talks about isn't just some ho-hum guy. He's not some nifty prophet. He's not some excellent teacher. He's not even like Moses or the angels that they believe brought the scriptures. He is above all of those things. He is like the man above the man that you can't even compare to the man. Jesus is that incredible. And so when he gets to the end here of chapter 13, he's listing off, ticking off these topics. And he's saying, hey, remember this. I'm closing the letter out. Remember this. He, thir back to 13, chapter, verse 1. He said, keep on loving each other. Don't forget to entertain strangers. Remember those in prison. Marriage should be honored by all. And then he gets to verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content. But why can you do that? Apparently, this was a problem for them. Apparently, they lived in a culture perhaps similar to ours where everything in media and everything in advertising tried to get you discontented so that you would buy more stuff. Like, for example, me, this past week, I have been working in my backyard, as I've shared with some of you, and I love, I enjoy it very much. The flowers are blooming. Ed was over. He saw the backyard. And I had this place, I had this conversation with my parents, and I said, you know, we've been thinking about getting a pond. And my mom said, yeah, it would look really good over there, and I've been thinking about that. So I've been scouring Craigslist like a good content person should. And I found one for only $100 that came with a thing to set in the ground and a filter and a pump and an aerator. And I was like, how can you pass that up? It's $100 for a pond. I've been looking for a pond. Well, I bought into the lie that if I have a pond, I'll be happy. I, I'm among friends. You bought into the lie, too. You know, if I have, not if you have a pond, you'll be happy, of course. That's my personal lie. But if you have a job, you'll be happy. If you have grandkids, you'll be happy. If you have money, you'll be happy. If you have a new car, you'll be happy. If you have contemporary clothes, you'll be happy. If you get a new house, like somebody over here, not to point any fingers or Shirley Brett, if you get a new house, you'll be happy. Now, you might be happier for a while, but eventually all that stuff, it's going to rust, burn, stain, rot, it's good for five years, ten years. I mean, it's not good forever, right? But somehow we find ourselves loving money a bit too much. And the evidence of that is we're discontent with what God's given us. So he says the secret here is set your mind on Jesus. Because Jesus is enough. Jesus makes all the stuff you have more meaningful. Because the stuff goes away, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus is secure. Therefore, because you can, you can keep your lives free from the love of money, verse 5, you can be content with what you have because, and here's the reason, what's it say? Because God has said, Jesus will never leave you, and Jesus will never forsake you. He never will. He will stay by you through thick and thin. He will stay by you through health challenges, broken down cars, health, uh, housing emergencies. 
He'll stay with you persistently and consistently. The word forsake, the word leave. The word leave means... I forget. Let me look. The word leave means... That's what happens when you forget your... Stop paying attention to your notes and go off script. Ah, leave. Leave, leave. Leave means to loosen his grasp. He will not leave you. He will not loosen his grasp on you. If we were out sailing and you fell off the ship and I grabbed your hand and your clothes were heavier than my hand and I held on for dear life and then you slipped out and you got chopped up by the propeller. I mean, that would be really bad for you, right? You know, so you want someone who's not going to leave go of you. And when it says that he's never going to leave you, that means he's going to hold on in a way that you can't get away from him. He's not going to leave you go. And then forsake. Forsake is if we were climbing up the mountain and we had been journeying for like four or five hours and the mountain was tall and we had drunk most of our water and about a half a mile, quarter mile from the top of the hill, you sprained your ankle like crazy. And you fell and you sat down and the tears are falling and your ankle's going whoosh. And I said to you, yeah, I'm sorry you're hurt. I'm a quarter mile from seeing that thing we walked toward. I'm going to leave you here and I'll be back. And so I walk off and leave you sitting on the side. I have forsaken you. And I'm coming back, mind you, but I'm going to go see what we came to see Jesus would not do that to you. Jesus will not see you sitting on the side, struggling along in your life, feeling the tension of all of the anxiety that goes along with the troubles, and say, you know, I'm just going to leave you there. I'll be back later, maybe, and help you get to the car. And when it says he won't leave you, you won't slip out of his grasp, and he won't forsake you. He won't just leave you abandoned on the side of the hill with a sprained ankle and no way to get to the car. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money by focusing on Jesus. He says, Jesus is that great. He says, be content with what you have because you have Jesus. And Jesus won't let you slip out of his hand. And Jesus won't let you sit on the side while he walks away. You've got something. Don't miss it. And then he continues, so we say with confidence. Confidence there is describing what he says. He's not just saying it flippantly. He's not saying it casually. He's not saying it like it doesn't matter. He's saying it's like, it is dependable as this. If I hop off on the next step, is isn't going to move. It's dependable. Jesus is that good. So we say confidently, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is going to help me with my trouble. I listened to Shirley Brett talk yesterday about concern that she's had. They've been trying to downsize, find a new house, and they've looked and they've looked and everything's gotten sold from underneath them. And it was quite the sorrowful time for Shirley and her family. And she kept the faith that God had something in mind. And she encouraged Billy, her husband, God's got something in mind. And this last week, God opened up something that had closed and he was her helper in her time of stress and anxiety. She leaned on him and he was faithful. The Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. What can man do to me? In the context, the writer of the Hebrews was warning people, hey, guys, you need to recognize there's a lot of persecution that comes your way. I'm going to be faithful even in persecution. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I will be your helper. Don't be afraid. So what are the things we might be afraid of? One, we're afraid of not having enough money. Isn't that a fear for you? It's a fear for me. What is it I'm afraid of, really? Most of what I'm afraid of is losing the comforts that I currently enjoy. I'm afraid that I'm going to lose the comfortable house and my comfortable job 
even if there are challenges, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my comfortable car, my stylish clothes. I'm really fearful because in this American version of Christianity, being a Christian means God's blessings on you, so you should have all this stuff. But as you look out into the rest of the world, the Christians frequently don't have any of this stuff. So we sell ourselves in this version of happiness equals monetary success because it provides comforts. When the question really is, is Jesus comfort enough? I I ask myself that question. Is Jesus comfort enough that even if it all goes south, and my health disappears, and my money disappears, and my job folds, and I have to depend on others for their graciousness. Is it okay? Well, of course it's not okay, but will it still be okay? Well, maybe. Maybe Jesus becomes more real to us when we don't have other things to rely on. And maybe we're actually missing some of the wonder of how God provides because we provide it all ourselves. So what might we be afraid of? Not having enough. The second thing he says we might be afraid of, of people hurting us. Now, I have never been a fan of people hurting me. In our context, in the Scriptures, there was a a great reality that there was likelihood of persecution. In our context, very minimal at least where we are at the moment. Now, there might be some on the horizon, but even still, different than back in the Roman days. But we're frequently nervous about what people think about us. And we frequently feel criticized, particularly in a work environment. There are some kind of some things that can be hostile there. But even in our neighborhoods, we're a little anxious about some of the things that can rub us. The text says... In truth, what can they do? Really, what what can they do? They can fire us. Is not Jesus going to take care of us? They can kick us in the teeth. Is Jesus not going to provide for us? They can steal our stuff. Is not there going to be something that takes care of us? Will we as a body not help each other? Is there not a heavenly home that is better than any of this earthly stuff we traipse around in? Is that not real? Because to the people that the the writer of the Hebrews was writing to, he was convincing them that Jesus was not only that real, but that the thing that Jesus created was that real. And it's something to behold. Once we get a picture that God has actually provided this for us, and he wants us to get there. And all of this thing here is just preliminary to the main event. Where things don't rust, and things don't break, and relationships don't get fractured. And that God is enough. The next topic is what about life works against this promise? You know, as you think about your life and this promise that Jesus is enough, we don't have to be afraid. Jesus is my helper, I don't have to be afraid. What is it that works against and makes this hard to believe that it's true? As you think of our culture, what does our culture lift? in every commercial, in every sitcom, in every networking group, in every educational setting, what does it elevate? Financial success? Business success? Prestige? Driving the nice car like Matthew McConaughey? That nice black car that he drives. I like that one. Having a better relationship with someone who's more whatever than we are, whatever. You know, society continually pummels us with this vision of, if you can just get this, you'll have enough. If you can just do this, you'll have enough. And it's interesting. We get all that stuff, and then we're like, ah, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. It's not as... It's not as redemptive as I dreamt it was going to be. 
you know, I got this new job and it's a whole lot more work than I thought it was going to be. And it's more headaches than I ever dreamed it was going to be. And the money is not nearly as good because they jacked up the insurance this year like they said they were going. I mean, but there's always these things. But culture sells us on this version that somehow more is better. And it fights against everything that these two verses talk about. If you have Jesus, you have enough. If you have Jesus, he will help you find enough. He will put you in a body where the body helps provide you enough. If you have Jesus, he has the ability to give you peace and contentment regardless of what the outside world provides. Now we need to be clear that financial success is not a sign of selling out to the system. Just because we financially succeed doesn't mean we're being corrupt somehow. Because the standard he gives us is not being wealthy. The standard he gives us is being content. You can have lots of money and be quite content and use your money for kingdom purposes. And God is exceptionally pleased. It delights him when we share the wealth that he's provided and we build the kingdom, and we invest in people, and we use it to further the kingdom. That is delightful. He taught, Paul talks about it in multiple places. Jesus references it too. So it's never money. It's always how money becomes an idol, just like we looked at in Luke. So what are our options? If this promise is true, what is it we should do? What are some choices we can make if we internalize this promise and we're convinced that Jesus is better than any worldly possession? What are some choices we can make? What do you think? What are some choices we can make? How about this one? I'll start us off. We can spend money on a new, you fill in the blank, new pond, I'm going to use mine, I can spend money on a new pond, or I can keep the little plot of land that I have to mow and practice humility or thankfulness or gratitude for what plot of land I actually have. Now, I didn't do that, but I could have. And I could have reminded myself, you know, Jesus has given me just about enough and I have just about enough work to do in my house. I don't need one more project. So what are our options if this promise is really true? Like, what do we actually do? I can wear my semi-non-stylish clothing, and I can say when I look in my closet, I'm thankful that I have something to wear today even though it doesn't look like I, what I've seen in the Land's End books for all the people that are cool and stylish. Other than my Land's End shirt, which my daughter bought me on sale, but that was a different thing. And I wear it a lot, as you see, because it's only one of the few shirts that I like in my closet, okay? But what about you? I mean, what are, what are some of the things that you could practice, ex experiment with, if this verse is really true, if Jesus is enough, if we are not loving our money and we're content with what we have, what might that mean for us? Any other ideas? Sure. You can write little notes on your check to tell people that you're thankful that you get to pay this bill because it's your responsibility. Yeah. Yep, that's right. What else? I mean, if this is true, if Jesus is our helper, if he's with us, never leaves us, let's go, never forsakes us, a man is us on the side of the road, that the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? How does that promote a spirit of graciousness with our money and contentment with our stuff? What might be a practical? Yeah, look, maybe you have an abundance of stuff. And the CCCDD, the Ciudad de Dios, has another yard sale this coming Saturday. It'd be a great time to bring some extra stuff up from your house. 
pile it in the foyer on Friday late afternoon. That's a great idea. Any other ideas of how we could experiment with this? Maybe from Luke chapter 16, verse 9? You know what Luke 16, 9 says, right? Oh, Jesus told this parable about the shrewd manager who gave his boss's stuff away. And then he was called in and the shrewd manager's owner says, oh, you were dishonest, but you were shrewd that you're going to be taken care of in eternity. And Jesus says, oh, you folks, you guys are, are really good at taking care of the people that are not of the light are really good at being shrewd with others, but people of the light are not very shrewd. So believers, we don't do that very well with money. He said, Luke 16, 9, use worldly wealth to make friends so that when it is gone, they will welcome you into their eternal dwellings in heaven someday. So you could throw a party with some of your money and invite all your friends over. Make friends and do it every week. I guarantee you throw a party with free food, you'll have people who'll come. I'll come. I'll bring my friends. We'll have a party at your house. That sounds good to me. But to think, okay, if this promise is true, what do I do? If this promise, yes, Kim? Great example. If you're looking at a job and you've got some options, you make a decision not based on what the economics are, but on whether God says this is the right thing for you. Is this what God would be pleased with? Is this a step of faith for me? Is this honoring God as my helper where I'm not being afraid? Great example. Great example. Is there anything else? Gene. Oh, that's a good one. Because Jesus is my helper, I'm going to focus on Jesus, and I'm not going to compare myself, my gifts, or my ministry with other people around me. And that my responsibility is to be faithful with what God has called me to do. And I need to do it well. And I, not need, to, I need to not criticize other people for not doing their thing as well. Oh, that's hard, too. Oh, as well as you do. Yes, yes. But if this is true, how does it affect how we do? I like that. That's kind of true. Oh, so what are, what are some other things? So what is it about God that supports this promise? We know that God is eternal, and he values what will be eternal. So part of this promise is to focus us on what's eternal. Secondly, God loves you really actually truthfully once you're good so anything that comes into your life is not because he's out to harm you he's not out to torture you he doesn't relish in your sense of despair and sorrow he really wants you to find his sufficiency he wants you to discover him fresh and new for today god supplied his children in the wilderness for how many years 40 as they wandered because moses wouldn't ask for directions okay no not for that reason but as they wandered, God provided everything they needed, right? So if God can take care of them for 40 years in the wilderness with no food, no water, no nothing, can he not take care of us? For like four days. Like we get anxious after four days, not 40 years. And then Jesus taught his disciples not to worry about tomorrow. And if your heavenly father provides for the birds, we should assume he's got a little extra to take care of us, right? So we ought not be afraid. So how can we experiment with this promise this week? Take the card, learn it. Take this card, carry it around, commit it to memory. Go phrase by phrase, statement by statement, make it part of your thinking this week. If you can't memorize all of it, work on the part that we talked about, which is the middle part. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Start there, underline it. The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Start there and then add the end and add the beginning, build it up. But start with something. Take the card, work on it tomorrow. Pray over it. Pray over this card. What that might look like is, God, 
you have said this is true. I need you to help me to see and believe that you're my helper. Because I'm not sure I see it right now. I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm nervous about this thing. I just want to tell you that, Lord. I want to tell you that I'm afraid. I need you to give me confidence. So we can pray over it. You can write it on your arm. Personal tattoo, okay? Take out your script, your Sharpie, like I did. Th- no, I didn't this morning, but <laughs> take out your Sharpie and your multicolor. Get permission from your parents before you guys do it. But take out your Sharpie, roll up that sleeve of yours, and put that little whatever it is that is your picture. I don't know. Whatever is relevant for you. Something to make you remember. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Tell somebody this. Go home today. Put it on your Facebook status. Go home today and call somebody that's in your neighborhood. You know what I heard at church today? I heard that Jesus will never leave me, never forsake me, and that the Lord is my helper and I don't need to be afraid. And so I'm trying not to do that. Have you ever heard that verse? Tell somebody about it. Yes, ma'am. That's right. So we're about what God is and what is his people. That's right. So think about some examples of how if this promise is true, I can experiment with this. Now, we were going to watch the video at the end, and we're out of time, so we're not going to do that. But I'll try to send it to you as a link. It's a story about a lady who is in uh, Nairobi who lived in this challenging spot. And her perspective shifted at some point. And then she lived differently. And see, that's the crux of this promise. That if we will really catch this picture that Jesus is for us and He's with us all the time. And He is our helper and we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of losing our money. We don't have to be afraid of not having quite the nicest stuff. We don't have to be afraid of people. It will change our perspective of how we relate to everything. And we'll find joy and contentment in the one that is made for the shape of our hearts. Is that not something that you're interested in? Would you not like to find joy that is the exact shape of the space in your heart that you've been trying to fill? This promise might be part of that story. Let's pray. We're not going to sing the closing song. Father, we are so thankful that you have revealed this truth to us. And we need you to work it into our lives this week. We're so thankful that we get to remember our brothers and sisters that are far away and going far away. We're thankful that we get to remember the past and how you have encouraged us in the past and present with the Zachary Taylor Scholarship and how you're going to lead and guide Bethany. We're so thankful that we get to live in this church family where you're doing these things that are just amazing with the Spanish church and the Vietnamese church and the food truck and the produce thing. And and they're just so phenomenal things that you have on a horizon. But Lord, what we really need is we really just need to have a picture of you that is capturing our hearts that we would serve and love because you have served and loved us. And I pray for folks today that are here and they're struggling with a sense of worth and value. That they have this place in their heart that just doesn't seem to be filled. And I pray, Jesus, that you will affirm in them your presence and delight that they will never slip from your hand and you will never leave them on the side of the road. And that they are receiving and will receive in this week your helpfulness and your mercy. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
Beloved, you are dismissed. May God fill you with joy as you walk with him. Take some vegetables, please, and if you throw me a couple of dollars to offset expenses, that's wonderful, and if you can't, that's fine too. I'd rather they go someplace. Anything that's left, we'll give to Ciudad de Dios, so don't worry about taking. If you don't